I think we're live. Hey everyone, this is Brody with uh, EverythingBoardGames.com. I have JP here uh, with his new game, new Kickstarter game, Death Path. JP? Yeah, what's going on, Brody? Thank you for having me. It's uh, a pleasure. Um, I've seen your guys work online, all the reviews, all the previews. It's good stuff. Oh, thank you. I, I, I kind of am jealous. I don't have my board game shelf behind me like you do yours, you know? You know, I set this chair up. I, I, I turned the table over. I set the chair up just to have a backdrop because when I'm doing uh, Zlurpcast, my podcast, not trying to get a plug in, it just happened. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I'm doing that, it, I'm in a, a room with nothing on the walls at all because like my wife's craft room where mm -hmm. our my main recording computer is. So this is, I took the laptop. I'm going to put it right here, plop it in front of something. So... <laughs> Oh, it's all right. See, my wife took my uh, my where I have my board games at. She's watching The Bachelor tonight. So ah, okay, the Bachelorette or what? You know, whatever they're doing. So all right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna hopefully have some little better programming than that right now. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um. So first of all, you got Death Path coming up. When does that release on Kickstarter? Um, that is going to be August fifteenth. So uh, we're recording this Monday. It's a week from tomorrow, August fifteenth, ten a.m. Central Time. Kickstarter goes live. Awesome. Um, yeah. So, Death Death. Quick, oh, there we go. <laughs> Printouts. Work, <laughs> work, work resources. Love it. <laughs> so, um, explain kind of the theme of the game. You know, what 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 is it about? You know, what what's your ex explanation of? You know, yeah. So um, it kind of all got started. Um, I've I've been getting older, like all of us here, and. Um, I started to reflect back, and there was an old episode that my co-host Brian and I had where we talked about games we invented when we were kids. And so in sixth grade, my buddies and I invented a game we played, you know, because we're cool. We stayed inside during recess, you know. Obviously, that's that's cool. And um, we created a game called Death Path, and it was like a very low-level, like, D&D. There was a map. We had these characters that we took. We had a book called how to draw monsters. And we like trace these characters. And we said, all right, your guy has a rope. My guy has a lantern. And we didn't play any of these games either at the time. So we had no idea that was even a real thing, that like people had stuff. So, like we just, I don't know. I mean, maybe little Nintendo, maybe a little bit like uh, the old role playing games. But so we did that. So then um, on, on an old Slurpcast, we talked about these old games. I'm like, oh yeah, Death Path. I'm like, I should do like a new version of that. But I'm like, I, I, I kind of want to do something more sci-fi. And so I just started to think for a while just about mechanics and all these different games that I've played. And the first step for me is um, what's different? What's something different? Now, I'm not saying that everything I come up with is the most original idea, but if I've never heard of something before, it's original to me. Somebody could look at it and be like, hey, you copied that, that. I'm like, I didn't even know about that. It's like when a band you know, creates a riff and someone sues them. You know, I didn't know. So I looked through, I thought about all the games that I've played, hundreds of games back from like, you know, when I was a kid playing like Axis and Allies and Risk and then moving on to Blood Bowl and Warhammer and all now all the new tabletop game like uh, Fantasy Flight Games and uh, cool, I mean, all these like cool like hybrid miniature uh, uh, board games. And I'm thinking, okay, what's different? And I said, you know, I want to do something. This is our first game that Zlurpcast Studios is publishing. So I don't want to go over the top. I would love to do a miniatures game. That would be awesome. Like one day. And even before that would probably be like a traditional board game. So I started, let's start with a card game, but with dice. I'm not a traditional card game player. I don't play Magic, those kind of games. But I like just kind of wacky card games where things could happen. So I started thinking about mechanics. And I said, you know, what if there was a game where you were going through a maze, and that was the death path. And every time you flip a card over, that's another uh, section of the maze you're going through. So I'm flipping over cards. You're flipping over cards. And whatever happens on there, that's what we have to do. A lot of the maze are just traditional kind of just straight ahead and going through, building up suspense. But then you might encounter a Pathfinder, which are bad. Those are the robot constructs put there by the government to slow you down. And so while you're fighting this guy, this guy's called a goon. While you're fighting the goon. Right there, huh? Yep. You're yep. So you're, you're fighting this Pathfinder. And while you're fighting him, your opponent's flipping over cards. They're making their way through the death path quicker than you are because you're slowed down by this guy. Um, so then you start to make your way through and you're going through and you may encounter like a path end, sort of like a dead end. You got to retrace your steps. And what happens in the game is you actually, you give your deck to your opponent. They're going to cut it anywhere they want and they're going to slide in um, cards that are another like dead end or a hidden path. So let me take one step back. So actually that split happens when you have like a choice. So you encounter a split like that 
or even a, uh, a three-way split where it's you can choose to go straight ahead or left or right. Then you give your opponent your deck to cut, and they, they slide in a path end card, which is that sort of spray-painted red X, or a hidden path card, the logo there. What happens then is now, since you made a choice, think about you're running in a maze, and you take a left or a right, you have a fork in the road, you might end up with a quicker way to the end. You might end up with a, a dead end and not hitting the end. So the basis of the game is revealing cards simultaneous. This could be for two players, three players, four players. I would say more than six, it's a little unwieldy. Um, two is great. Like most of the people I show say two is the most fun, but then I've done multiplayer and everyone had a blast because it's four people playing. Um, so whether you're playing two or four or six players or, or an odd number, I don't know why I stuck with those, but um, everyone is revealing cards at the same time. And so that's why I said, if there's like a ton of people, it's like, what do you got? Okay, you got that. And, it's a little much sometimes. So when you have the card, you have to resolve them. And so what tends to happen is this one, the art might be redone on this one. It's a prototype. But let's say there's a fight card that I reveal. So now I can just wait and like kind of like wait behind a corner, ready to go. And you're, you're going through. You're making your way through the maze. You know, you're going, going through, going straight. All of a sudden you turn a corner and boom. I get an ambush on you. If you turn a corner, I'm waiting to hit you. And I get to hit you, and you don't get any defense dice. Kind of just like, you know, waiting to get your butt kicked. Or so you're, a corner. Yeah, a corner for that one. So okay. there's, there's an ambush. So if I'm, if I'm waiting to fight, I'm waiting around a corner, then I can ambush you, and you don't get any defense dice. If I'm waiting on a fight card, and you reveal a fight card, then we're both going to fight each other. We're both kind of ready. One round, and then we go our separate ways. If we both reveal a fight card at the same time, then it's kind of like, you know, the death path is very much like a running man, um, hunger games kind of feel of like a game show to entertain the masses and you might see somebody die too. It happens. Uh, so when we both reveal a fight card at the same time, then it's like, you know, the guards come out, the bailiff comes out and he sets up a three round bout. So it's three rounds. And I like to joke, like it's like a like a Street Fighter kind of game, like round one, fights, because you're kind of like opposite ends going at it, three rounds, and whoever wins that fight, they get to make their way quicker, they kind of get, you know, a bit of a head start, while the guards hold the loser down for a little bit and make him kind of go a different way. So the object of the game, I kind of, in a roundabout way, um, you want to get to the end of your maze deck. It's 109 cards in the maze deck, but the moment you start in for each player, for each player, correct. Yeah. The moment you start splitting your deck up, well, that, that gets a whole lot smaller. You know, and what happens, though, if you end up on a path end, so if you end up actually getting that, um, you know, red X where it's like, well, I'm, I'm stuck, um, you end up grabbing your unused cards. It's called unexplored, and that becomes your new maze deck. So you could have split your deck, and now you're down to here. The other one's up here. But if you hit that path end, you got to start with this one. So you put that aside, and that's your new maze deck. So it's uh, – a lot of random elements to it. I'm not going to say this is the strategist favorite game of like, all right, I'm going to analyze. There's a lot of random elements. There's no question. You're rolling dice for attacking. I've got custom. Uh, these are huge because these prototyped. I don't know why these are gigantic, by the way. Um, <laughs> they, everything looks bigger online. And so, like, I ordered these blank dice. <laughs> They're gigantic. Well, at least we can see them, you know. Least, yeah, great for the video. Yeah. So um, a D12 is a two-handed weapon. So this is a stun blade. This is a fusion staff. I've got cards that represent this as well. But these are not sequentially numbered. Okay, so the fusion staff has, has a bunch of ones and some tens and elevens on there. High risk, high reward. Whereas the stun blade is a little more consistent. Fives, sixes, and sevens on there. You got to decide what weapon is best for you when you when you pick up a stash card and you go to grab a weapon. Um, I've also got some D8s, custom as well. Oops that are the one-handed weapons. The gold one, it'll be, it'll be gold on the actual ones, that's more yellow, uh, is the uh, uh, power knucks, so like kind of a futuristic brass knuckles. Then the energy glove is the silver one. This one's a little higher powered, but some risk. This one's a little more consistent. Uh, if you end up getting two one-handed weapons, you can wield both of them, fight with two of them. If you have the same you're weapon these weapons while you're running through somehow is that yep. so as you're flipping over cards you're revealing cards there's certain cards that'll say stash okay. and that stash you open up this metal crate and you get a weapon inside you might get a trap could blow up in your face um you might get a health stim sort of an injection to get you a little more health but most of the time it's going to be weapons 
And so you got to decide what weapons you want to keep. You could equip one in your left hand, one in your right hand. The two-handed weapons would take up both hands. Um, and you got a spot for one storage too. So kind of like three items at any one time. But let's say you got two of the same one-handed weapon. I got a, a left-handed energy glove and one in my right hand too. So now I roll them both and I get to re-roll any of the dice too. Because it's your you know, same weapon, you're a little more handy with two, two of the same weapon. Um, so it's, uh, it's very fast, it's very brutal. The game, once you know how to play, it takes about 20 minutes, um, 30 minutes maybe on a, you know, a bit of a longer game. And then if you add multiplayer, if you go to four players, it's about 40 minutes. So it's still a fast game. Um, and it's just because um, you're, you're going through the death path and everything you do is to get to the end quicker or take out all the other opponents. So if you're playing one-on-one, -on -one, I just got to beat one person down. If you're playing four-player, it's really hard to win by elimination. You just you got to get try to get to the end quickest. Yeah, I was, I was watching your uh, playthrough video, and I oh. I thought of you know why would it why would you even wait? You're not going through your deck, you know why would you wait and let someone else go faster yeah. until someone actually pops someone you know waiting around That's the corner and, and it did a huge amount of damage. And I thought. Okay. <laughs> That, you know, that answers why. Yeah, you're exactly right. So I think in that video, I had the um, fusion staff, which is the most powerful weapon in, in the base game. And my wife was playing as the other character, Mizzy Pizone, the sort of cheerleader, martial artist, at, uh, assassin. I was playing Zoe Joxer, the former five sports star athlete, kind of reminiscent of some multi-athlete I've heard of. I don't know. <laughs> and um, because, you know, you were go going out at recess, so you. That's, <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what football is. Uh, baseball. What are these foreign things to me? Um, so she had like no energy left, no health left, and so I'm like, I'm just gonna wait. And eventually, I was able to get her. Um, so that's a big part of it too, is the ambush concept of. Um, is it best to speed your way through, or is it best to try to win uh, in a more brutal fashion? So is it pretty even, you know, if you lose from someone killing you or from someone beating you? You know, is it pretty even from what yeah. happened? Yeah, we've played, um, I mean, countless games, um, and the only uh, thing I've noticed is, like I was saying earlier, multiplayer, it's generally someone gets to the end of the death path. The winner, on like when you play more, when I say more, more than two player, somebody's getting to the bottom of the deck because it's hard to kill three other people. But when you're playing two player, which is the base game, what a lot of people are gonna be playing, um, it's about even with, um, who get, with winning by making it to the end of the death path or winning by being the last subject standing. They're called subjects, uh -huh. characters, so. Now, um, I saw one of those cards that had like, you go right, you can go left, or you can go straight. Yeah. Now explain to me why, you know, why wouldn't, why would you want to go straight instead of splitting your deck? That's a good question. Yeah. So the, um, I'll have this one here now for showing, but yeah, there was one, of course it fell off, uh, it went straight ahead. So right. what you can do, let's say you just got a, you got a good, a good streak going, you know, you're like, you know, I'm making my way through and I have a feeling I'm going to get there before my opponent. So when it's that three way, you can just treat it like this car to keep going straight. Um, there are times where. I just, I'm going through it. I'm like, you, I don't want to split because when you, when you split your deck, your opponent is taking a path end card and a hidden path card. Both are subject to change, I should say. These two are not <laughs> totally. But um, so this is like a secret compartment in the death path. Open it up and you slide through and you get through quicker. This makes you retrace your steps. So when you split your deck, these two cards are going in either one side the other side or one in each. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. So it's a chance. If you treat that split as just a straight ahead, there's, there's no chance, I, I'm, I'm going straight. I have nothing to lose. Whereas if you split, if you say, I'm gonna go left, I'm gonna go right, you might run into this, which is bad, which means you start, um, not all the way over, but you start basically rechasing your steps. And it's gonna take a lot longer. But you might find a hidden path, which lets you flip over the next five cards and ignore everything that's on there if you want. That's so, good. yeah, it's, it's good if you have a lot of cards to split. Yeah, if you're got a thin deck. It might be you know good to go straight. Definitely. What what I've noticed was at the beginning, you definitely want to split. If you encounter one of those early on because you got a lot of cards, why not? You mm -hmm. don't really. I mean, I don't want to say you have nothing to lose because you might encounter a path then, but. When you start to split several times, you could actually split five times total. That's why there's five each of these and five each of these in there. So there's three uh, two-way splits and two three-way splits. So there's a total of five split cards in the entire 109-card maze deck. 
if you split that many times, well, one, you you don't even remember what what you've seen and what you haven't seen at that point. It's kind of like it's like a uh, the memory game, but like you, I, I can't remember after like two splits. I'm like, where did it, where was that at? Was that in this one or was that in that one? Um, so the more times you split, you don't know what's going to happen. And there have been times where I've got hidden path. Awesome, I'm running through, and then I still encounter a few after a path end because of a previous split that I forgot about. So it's um, a lot of random elements. If you have a good memory, it'll be helpful, but there's still a lot of, a lot of times where you're just like, I don't remember what happened there. Um, so there, there's some things like, you know, what weapons have been used or if there's any health stims left or any traps still left. So there's some memory aspects to what we've both seen already. And maybe like um, there was one of the, one of the pathfinders, this one's called the Brutes. There's only one in the whole deck. Um, he's basically wailing on you, and you got he's got 15 points of, uh, of health. He's going to inflict three on you every single round, so he's a tough one to beat. So if you know you've encountered him already, you're like, well, I'm not going to see him again because he's already been seen. But if you haven't, then you know he's waiting for you. So there is that element of after you play the game a few times, you know what cards are in there, so you know what to hope for, what to expect. Gotcha. Now, to actually make it through the maze, say someone splits it, they put in one deck over here, they put, you know, the, uh, the X, you know. Oh, yeah, path end, yeah. Path end. Yep. And then they decide, you said you could put it in the same deck. Yeah. So they put that other one in the same deck here. Right. And you decide you take this other deck. Right. If you make it through all that, is that the end? or? Yeah, I mean, if, if you, ne well, unless you encounter another split, Right. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. You can have another split. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say um, if by chance you exactly what you said happened. So I'm going through the maze. I'm going to try to like play this out. Sorry. I should have planned this better. No, <laughs> they're, they're all scattered on my desk now. <laughs> all right. So going through the maze, you get to a split. I have no choice. I can't go straight ahead. So it's left or right. So I have to give you my deck. And so my opponent, I don't know if you caught that earlier, my opponent taking the deck, you're going to put in this and this in those two halves. So mm -hmm. let's say to your example, you put him in this one, the left one. I take the right one. I keep revealing cards over and over again. As long as I don't split again, yeah, I mean, I should have a pretty uh, easy path. I mean, I'm going to encounter some pathfinders. They're going to kick my butt a little bit. And I might encounter a fight card where you might kick my butt a little bit. But essentially, yes. Um, but there's a good chance another split's going to come along. There was, there's, I think, three of these in there. So if the other two were in that other one with these two, then yeah, you, you should be okay, but you never know. Yeah. Now, now, would you call that deduction right there, you know? Yeah. Like looking at them and saying, all right, let's see. Let's decide which one you put in which, or kind of doing that. Would you call that? Yeah, there, I, yeah, I would call some deduction. What's really funny is, you know what it ended up in our playtest games? It ends up being like the Princess Bride scene with like the, you know, the, like, I thought you were going to put the poison there. Now, you know, and, we're, we're, we're doing that to the T, like what'll happen, uh, I'll split the deck and I'll put like, I'll make one of them real small, one of them real big. And I'll put them out there and they're like, well, you're obviously not gonna give me the small one. You're gonna put, you know, so you want me to, I'm like, okay, if that's what you think, but that, you know, and so it's a lot of that, kind of some fun mind games in there. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, the, the hardest part, like I said, is once you reach your second split, remembering what happened. Because if you have to go back with your unexplored deck, it's like, was there another one in there? Or because I might not have gotten to the other path. You know, it's kind of, you start to forget. So there's uh, people who have a good memory, I, I think do a little better in the game, but overall anything can happen, honestly. It's 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 uh, pretty random because the, there's, there's the dice too. You're rolling dice for fighting. So, I mean, you know, you, oh, I should also say, I, I didn't touch on this. So when you roll your, um, your uh, weapon dice, you're also rolling attack and defense dice. So, Every single subject in the game is going to have their own custom D6s, okay? So these are custom. They have non-sequential numbering based on the strength of the weapon. But every character has their own color D6s. Um, hit's going to have like a, like a one sword. Crit's going to have three swords. But you have a, a hit dice that's going to have a number of hits on there. So in this case, this is Mizzy's dice. She has three hits and three blanks. Her crit dice, she has two crits and nothing else. And then she has a defense dice. She has evade, which could ignore one of these that your opponent rolls. She has block, which will have the damage. Disarm can knock the weapon out of their hand and also block. So you roll these along with the weapon dice for your result. And so 
if I end up rolling a hit and a crit, and my weapon I'm fighting with is the fusion staff, I would then pick one of these. So I'm gonna take the crit, because a crit does plus two more damage. The hit would just be whatever I rolled. So the hit would be an eight. If I had a crit, I'm gonna uh, link that one to it, and that's now a 10. So that's how the fighting works in there. You roll your attack dice and the weapon that you're armed with, or weapons. Uh, if you are armed with two weapons, you actually get to apply both dice. So if you had a hit and a crit, guess what? One of these energy gloves hits you with a crit, so that would have been a, a seven or a nine. The other one was a hit, maybe just a six, and you put them both together. So it is overall probably better to use two one-handed weapons, and ideally two of the same weapons so you could reroll your dice, but you never know what you're going to get. I mean, there's other items, like I said, a health stim, there's a trap, there's a shield, which lets you reroll your defense dice. So a lot of times when you have a chance to get a one-handed or a two-handed weapon, you usually just take that because you never know what you're going to get again. Yeah. Brian here says uh, he hopes it's better than the uh, techno, you know, the techno bowl uh, dice, but the box <laughs> says good. Yes. Did you see that box there? <laughs> so yeah, Brent, uh, my, my buddy Brent uh, made the game and it's um, like, there's a, uh, so was that Brian one of the comments online? Is that that yeah. Brian? Oh, okay, okay. I didn't know if it was somebody you knew or um, okay. So. Yeah, so he's right. The Techno Bull dice, um, are, one of them is not, doesn't really feel like a weighty dice. It's kind of a little off, so I don't use those. But uh, <laughs> yes, these are custom dice made in China, so you know it's good. <laughs> I mean, cheap. I mean, you know, that's how, that's how you make cheap stuff. That's right. <laughs> so. So, so pretty much in the game, you'll be flipping cards and rolling dice. Yes. A little bit of that deduction. Yeah. Am I missing anything? No, it's uh, simultaneous yeah, actions. So if you're playing four players, for example, everyone's revealing cards at the same time. And so that sometimes gives you some options. Let's say you got two people, uh, you know, that, that uh, pull a fight card. You're waiting around a corner to hit them, you know, that kind of – so there's a lot of that kind of who do you want to beat up element. Um, yeah. I, I did put one rule in there for multiplayer that when you encounter a split – on multiplayer, um, whoever had the last split is the one to take your deck and split it. That way there's a little less of the team ups, like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, always take the left one whenever I give you that kind of thing. So you can still team up on people if you want to, but um, I took a little bit of that away with, with one rule in there, but you, you're exactly right. It, it's essentially a um, revealing cards, making your way through the death path. That's sort of, so this is the death path. And um, if things go well, there'll be like a story to tell about this. You know, uh, further fluff, comic books, maybe other games. Um, I have a lot of a lot of background I want to definitely put into play if possible. Um, I should probably show you this as well. Um, so there is the actual. Oh wow, where is that? So the the characters in the game are the we saw the cheerleader. Here's where we go. Wow. So these will be actual cardboard. These are printouts for now. So you have Zojoxer. Um, art done by Scott Delcini did a great job with things. Um, and then we have Mizzy Pizone, the former cheerleader. And you're going to have – Wait, who, who did the art? So his name is Scott Delcine. Okay. Uh, he, is, uh, he does a podcast called Both Down, a gaming podcast. And uh, he's been doing a lot of comic books. So him and I kind of work together on a lot of this stuff. And, uh, you know, the base game comes with those two characters. Within the Kickstarter, assuming everything goes to plan, you're going to see very early on stretch goals for two more characters um, within, I'd say, within maybe a, a thousand after the goal. So the plan is if people want to play multiplayer, four player, right away, you're going to get two sets of the games and four characters. Actually, you'll get, technically, you'll get a, you'll get a duplicate of these because it's two boxes, but you'll get two extra characters is the point. So that way, right off the bat, you get two games, you'll have four maze decks, and you'll have four characters to play right away without duplicates. Yeah, so you don't have to play the same player as someone else, right? Right, exactly. And uh, we're going to have a pledge level to make your own character. So if you wanted to be have, you know, Brody the Assassin, you know, you could be in the game. Uh, so we're going to do a lot of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, and every character, keep in mind too, every character that we create is going to have their own custom D6s that go with them. And they're all different. There's different combinations. Some are heavy on the defense. Some are heavy on the offense. Um, there's also special a special trait that goes with each character. For example, Mizzy, she has quick reflexes. She can use her defense dice during an ambush. Nobody else can do that. 
Um, whereas Zoe Joxer, he's just intimidating. Zoe knows he has plus one I guess all Pathfinders. So everyone's gonna have a trait as well. We really wanna make these characters very unique and um, thematic to this uh, sort of, uh, you know, near future type uh, setting inside the Death Path. And you'll start to also uncover uh, further plans of the government and why they're doing this and what this is a part of. I wanna expand the background even more. And hopefully this game is uh, a stepping stone to that point. Yeah. They're, they're asking in chat, uh, how much for that pledge level? I think that they were referring to the to the uh, character. Yeah, so the character, I believe, uh, 175. Um, and that's a bulk of that's gonna go directly to the artist. Um, and the other big part of it is every character gets custom dice and those little extra cost in that. So um, I believe the pledge levels will be 29. And I, I only say I believe because there's a, a one extra quote I'm waiting for on, on something else, on some stretch goals. But um, we're looking at 29 for the base game. Um, and this is, I'm not charging shipping early on because I honestly don't know what the final shipping is going to be. I have it set up where the quotes I'm going to be getting are the actual cost. I don't want to overcharge anybody for shipping. So like games in the U.S. will be shipped from the U.S. Games in Canada will be shipped from Canada. So I'm trying to avoid custom charges. So I'm looking at 29 for the base game, 55 for two of the game. So you can play four player right away. And there should be 175. I'll double check. It's a chance it's 185, but 175 for create a character, which also gets you two games too. So you're gonna get two games and your character. And then we've got the the ultimate pledge level at 349. That's um I don't know if I want to totally go into it just yet. I, can I give a tease or do I have to say what it is? No, nope, you can give a tease. Okay. Um, it's pretty special. It's for the most hardcore fans that want to get uh, up close and personal with the creators of the game. So we'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right. Um, so I want to, you know, talk to you. I want you to explain your background and, you know, Zlurpcast and all that. But, but there was one thing I wanted to mention because I thought it was important while I was watching your video. When you decide you're splitting and everything, you're not going back to, you know, you're not setting aside those decks in a row. You're combining them all. Yeah. And so if you do hit a... The okay. F, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, path end. Path end. Yeah, yeah. Well, let, me, let me tell you why it's not called. So everybody asks, why didn't you call it dead end? And the reason for that is there's a future expansion planned called dead end where you could play as bad guys and you're called those those people are dead ends because they're they're there to kill you. So that's that's so if anyone's wondering, why don't you just call it dead end? Because there's going to be a better, a bigger and badder dead end. Um, but yes, to your point. So. Every time you start with a new maze deck, you grab that unexplored and you're going to shuffle it. So on top is totally fine. Underneath, it doesn't really matter because every, every time you have unexplored cards and you hit a path end, you put those on top of the other ones. So you're always going to have a stack of unexplored and a stack of what you've been through already and, and the one that you're currently on. Sorry, it's probably confusing. So the idea behind that is um, if you have this stack, okay, so you have, here we go. I have one that I haven't totally demolished over here. Uh, so <laughs> you have your starting maze deck. And I'm going to try not to have these all fly out. When I, so You're going to flip them over, and each card happens, obviously. When you encounter that path end, you actually will uh, – you take the split. You keep one. One goes over there. If you encounter another one, let's say if you encounter another split, then that one gets split. If you encounter a path end, now this is your new deck. And so every time you have a split, those other cards are just going on top of the unexplored. You might get to them eventually, or you might not. You, you, might, you might not ever see those. And so the idea behind that is it doesn't really matter if it's um, on top or underneath. Every time you grab a new maze deck, a new path, essentially, you're shuffling the cards. So even if your opponent slides in, like the classic move is always like, I'm going to put that in at the bottom. So it's the last card you get. Like, doesn't matter. I'm going to shuffle. It doesn't matter. Not, not a sneaky easy thought. However, in that gameplay video, it was the last card, and that was not – I can't stage that. There was there was shuffling. You know, it was crazy. It was the last card in there. That It's rare when that happens. But, you know, I think that's better because, you know, it doesn't get overcomplicated of, oh, crap, what deck do I go back to? Yeah, you know, yeah. Who knows what, what we're even doing now? And yeah, yeah. You know what's really funny is that was actually in the original rules. I did have that. So I brought – after I created the concept, I brought it over to my partner, Brian Mitchell, who does Lurpcast with me as well. 
And I said, all right, we're going to play through. And he did that. And I was like, all right, this is here. This is here. He's just like, what is all this? He's like, why don't you just put them all together? I'm like, but then you don't know what's what. He's like, it's unexplored. It doesn't matter. They're all unexplored. I'm like, that's a good point. It really doesn't matter. They're, they're pet. This is an sort of evolving maze, and it, at least to our in our eyes, we don't know what's coming up next. So that was sort of a. Um, he brought like a few what I like to call like genius concepts, which are just like the most simplified way. And this isn't an insult to Brian, even though he knows I love him. But uh, this is like, wow, he took what I wanted to do and made it actually work in a game. And so he did that for the weapons, and he did that for the. Um, the splits as well, which, I mean, yeah, you don't want it overcomplicated. And it, the way it works now, it's actually smooth. So I was very happy he came up with that. They're, they're, they're asking in chat now, uh, You can those are standard sleeves that you can put on those cards or what? Yep, standard sleeves. So if you want to sleeve them, they are a normal magic card size, um, 68 by 89 for all your metric fans out there. <laughs> it's America. Is it two and a half by three and a half? I think, is that the inches of version of it? I think so. Uh, I know there's a lot of math geeks out there that are loving this. <laughs> so yeah, st standard card sizes. The um, the character cards are a little bigger. Um, I mean, you won't really have to sleeve. You, if you, probably those top loaders if you ever want to use those. But um, those are, it's about a five by seven-ish. Um, I'll get those specs um, a little bit later. But um, they're going to be a little harder card stock. Uh, the health tokens. Are, they're not going to be these little chips. They're going to actually be cardboard cutouts of the logo of the game. So that'll be your health tokens. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I want you to talk, you know, tell us about your background, just lerp cast um, yeah. real quick before we do that. If anyone's in chat watching this, go ahead, write your question down. We'll get to it, uh, you know. But go ahead. JP. Okay, thanks. Um, so I've been playing – board games for my whole life. I have older brothers and sisters and parents who love playing board games all the time. And obviously as a kid, you play the traditional ones that was around. And then eventually my older brother, Dean, was like, you gotta check out Risk. I'm like, okay, we started playing that. And then in junior high, I started playing uh, Axis and Allies with my friends. And we were at the time just kind of, you know, we were learning US history, you do the whole, you know, you're learning world history. It was just like that moment of, cool, we could actually, you know, play out what we're reading in the books. And that's what we were doing. So the five of us would get together. We all had a country. We do what people, you know, how people generally play that game. And then time went on and started to play other games. And I started to get introduced to miniature games. And Blood Bowl was my main game. Um, loved it. And that was what um, I met a lot of my friends through Blood Bowl and through playing a football-based game with miniatures. And that's when I met Brian Extreme at a Blood Bowl tournament. And we got together. And we're like, we should do a podcast. Hey, we should. We should definitely do a podcast. So then we started to do a podcast about Blood Bowl and about tournaments. And then eventually we said, well, we're playing lots of games. We're playing board games. We're playing card games. We're playing uh, other war games. So then we just started to make the podcast about other things and just tabletop games in general. And so then we did that. And then now it's like, okay, well, what's the next step? Like, you know, we should probably make a game. We should probably make a game. And so we started to kick around ideas for that. And so we kind of went back and forth on how we should start and you know, our end goal is to make, you know, full on board game and miniature games, like, you know, high, high quality, the kind you see from these companies like, you know, cool mini or not, and that you're seeing on Kickstarter that, you know, these million dollar games, whatever. And so for us, it's like, that's an, that's a great end goal. If we could ever get to that point, we can't start there. Like, it's just not going to work. We, we, we have a following, which is going to help helpful, but we got to start somewhere. So we decided let's start with a card and dice game. Um, and this is, sort of the, the stepping stone to what's going to come next. I would love to do further things in the Death Path universe. And just as we have a few other, um, I guess we'll say, concepts, backgrounds that we want to incorporate games to as well. And so with Brian and I still doing the podcast every single month, we usually pick a game, talk about whatever. Our next episode is going to be about Death Path because, hey, it's, it's our game. Let's, uh, let's do one for us, right? And uh, it'll actually answer a lot of questions and give people some details if they want to back it. It'll, it'll come out right when the Kickstarter goes live. Um, but that's kind of how the story went, you know, starting with uh, board games, going into miniature games, started doing the podcast, and now we're making our own games. And um, a, a big part of it was, do we decide to design games and pitch it to a publisher? Or do we decide to actually do it ourselves? If we didn't have the podcast, if we didn't have fans that we've interact with, friends all over the world. I mean, I, I could literally go to most countries in Europe and know someone I could stay at their house if I wanted to. I could, you know, which is crazy, all because of the podcast. It's, 
you know, we have nothing but love for the people who enjoy the show. And so we're thinking, because we have these people, I think we could do it ourselves. We're going to find out. It could totally flop. And back to the drawing board. But that was the only reason we decided to not design games and pitch it to a publisher. We decided to publish it ourselves because we think that we've already built something and we hope we can build off of the audience. Yeah. Um, so not to distract from what we're talking about, but I keep on looking at your shirt there. And, you know, I haven't seen your, your podcast, but is that a Zlurpy? Yes. So a the, <laughs> the love... Of course I wore it. Product placement, right? Um, so it's, what, what is in that Zlurpee? You know, what um, is Zlurpee? It is, it is, a, is a magical sauce that all, our, all of our ideas come from. Illegal in 12 states, of course. But uh, no, it's, a, it's so the origin of the Zlurpee is actually, so my partner Brian came up with it. Um, in the game of Blood Bowl, everything is a parody. They're all NFL parody, like the, the Oakland Raiders, or like the Oakland Raiders. So... <laughs> He created like, what if there was like like a, a Slurpee parody called a Slurpee, and it you know kind of may, might make you uh, a little tipsy, might be like a like a like a you get drugged or whatever, all that kind of stuff. And so that was the parody of that. So he created a tournament called Slurpee Bowl, and then so people will come every year. It became the largest Blood Bowl tournament, like not like an official GW tournament like in in the country. It was crazy. And so that's when we said, what about a podcast name? And he told me, he goes, I don't want to call it Slurpcast. He's like, I don't want you to feel like it's, I'm like, no, dude. I'm like, you've already built a thing. I'm going to jump on that thing because <laughs> that's, uh, once again, much like uh, designing a game. If you have an audience, if you have a background, why ditch it, right? You know, build on it. So that's where it came from. And Slurpcast was born. And I will say, because you brought it up, I totally forgot about this. So I have this sort of dream stretch goals for the campaign that who knows if we'll ever get to certain things, but there's going to be a card that is a, like a magic Slurpee card. And it's going to have just the most the most wild effects in the game uh, if you consume this, this Slurpee. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, that, that's where it all came from. And we decided, you know what, that's that's the podcast now. There better be a Slurpee card in every game you make. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, if it's, uh, you know, <laughs> push the brand out there, you know, of course. We, the, the first step is rewarding the backers with some uh, some cool exclusives. But, uh, yeah, the, the plan is all these new characters that come out, these new subjects, new weapon packs, um, the plan is to have expansions that go with it. Um, I mentioned Dead End with playable bad guys in there. I also want to have an expansion for solo play. So in, in the Death Path, when you go to the, uh, the second floor, so you take that you know, little elevator down, in the uh, second floor of the, the, the basement of the Death Path is actually a, uh, a version of the maze that comes alive. And so that's solo play as you're going to be fighting against the actual maze itself. And um, I'm kicking around some ideas. I think I'm going to call it a uh, solitary assignment. Kind of a, so we'll see if that works out. But that's a stretch goal that I want to make because everyone loves solo games. Um, and I think that with the base game, I can't do it with how I have it set up. So it has to be an expansion. But that expansion is going to be pretty amazing. You're going to have, you're going to be rolling dice for the maze against you. So you don't know what's going to happen. You know, I'm, in my head, I'm thinking like, you know, like a castle in Mario Brothers with like, you know, fire sticks and all kinds of, you know, walls closing in, all that kind of stuff. So that, that's a plan for the future that I really want to make happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited for you. I hope you. I hope you have more games coming. Um, you know, I know this is just the beginning here. Is it? Is this the first one? Is I, I never asked that, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is definitely our um, our maiden voyage. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be our baby. And, you know, I'm, I'm planning to take this, if this goes well, take this one further. Uh, Death Path might be a miniatures game one day. It might be like a uh, Warhammer Quest, Space Hulk-ish kind of, you know, dungeon crawl type game. Um, who knows? But this is the first one. We've got some other ones that are in the works. We've got a um, sort of a Wild West themed game that we're working on, more miniature based. Um, and we've got a one about, uh, there's some characters we have on Slurpcast. There's a, there's an infamous character on the show called G-Dub. And he is a... Um, He's from the streets, you know. He's uh, he's a, he thinks he's a tough kid, and he's a uh, he, he's an aspiring rapper. So we ha we have a game for the Slurpcast fans in the works that uh, might have some G Dub elements to it. That uh, kind of a board game uh, type thing. So uh, there's a lot of stuff in the works. We've got a uh, you know we took our old notebook of random ideas, and now it's this Google Drive folder with hundreds of documents. So um, so yeah, this is the first one, hopefully of many. We hope people watch this and back it and like what we're trying to do. And uh, 
We're just trying to put together fun games, not overcomplicate things. You know, it's all about the gaming experience. When you get together with your buddies and your family, significant other, you want to roll dice, you want to flip over cards, you want to have some tactics, but it's about having fun, about laughing and some memories. And that's the types of games that we aim to create. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, being here with us. Um, where can, you know, if they have questions, anything, I know you're on Facebook. Yep. Um, I'm all over. Not- I am, uh, yeah, I, I'm all over the internet at all times. In fact, sometimes it keeps me from getting work done. So uh, all, <laughs> um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, if it's uh, Death Path specific, um, feel free to use Death Path Game on all three of those. Also, deathpath.com. Uh, if you want to reach out to me personally, uh, I'm on Twitter under JP4Media, so the number four media. Um, and obviously, Zlurpcast as well, Z-L-U-R-P-C-A-S-T. Hold on. Yeah, I spelled it right. Uh, so Slurpcast, you, we're on iTunes, we're on Twitter, Facebook, all of that. Um, yeah, basically, a bunch, you know, all, you guys are everywhere. You got a lot of fans, so we're trying to aspire to have the type of community you guys have built as well. So, well, I think you know you might have a new fan here, so I'll awesome. have to tune and you know watch your show and everything. Well, appreciate it. We'll be uh, Thanks. you know sending sending this out here later, getting your game launched. But awesome. All right, thanks a lot. I appreciate it, and. Um, You know, check the game out, watch the videos. If you like it, jump in. We'd love to have you part of the family. All right.